Feast TV is brought to you with support by Missouri Wines and Whole Foods Market at Town & Country and the Galleria. In this episode of Feast TV, we head to Leaky Roof Meadery to taste some of Missouri's best mead. Then we're heading to Columbia to find out how Strange Donuts and Soul Taco have combined into one space. Then we're off to Vox Vineyards to learn about Native American grapes and we're wrapping it up with none other than the world-renowned Fran Adria at the Nelson Atkins Art Museum. I'm Kat Neville and this is Feast TV. In this episode, in the intro, I mentioned Ferran Adria, and we are going to be cooking three of his recipes from this book, which is The Family Meal. Now, if you aren't in the industry, you might not know what a family meal is, but it's the meal that the staff at the restaurant eats before their shift begins in the evening. This book has a bunch of different really fun, easy to cook at home menus that were designed by Ferran Adria and served at El Bulli. So we're going to be making one of those today. And also in the intro, if you saw those cans behind me, that was at Leaky Roof Meadery, which is very close to Springfield, Missouri in Buffalo. Now they're one of the only places in the state of Missouri that are producing this very ancient yet trendy beverage that is um, entirely based on honey. So I am just gonna finish up cutting up this loaf of bread for our cod sandwiches that we'll be making later on in the episode. And let's go meet the guys at Leaky Roof right now. Most people think we do sausage or some sort of meat, a meatery, um, when they first come in. Um, we do get a lot of calls from roofers, thinking that we're a roofing company though, yeah. <laughs> well, a lot of times, you know, people will come in and they'll say, um, is it like a beer wine or, um, you know, it's just really hard for people to kind of wrap their brain around it initially. Um, basically, if we can get people to try it, we find that uh, most of the time they end up really enjoying it. Mead is the oldest known fermented beverage to mankind. We know the hunters and gatherers were pulling it in before the uh, advent of agrarian society. Um, so we don't really have an idea of how far back it goes, but it definitely predates written history. Mead at its most basic is a fermented product based on the fermentation of honey. Um, a lot of people think mead is a full strength wine that's very sweet, but in reality it can be presented in a variety of different fashions. We here present um, session strength or low alcohol meads that are lightly carbonated and run the gamut from sweet to dry. Um, there are places that make meads that are almost exclusively like dry white wines and others that really focus on the large, sweet, honey forward products. But uh, at its heart, as long as it's been made from fermented honey, that's, what, that's mead. Uh, this is our base mead, it's the Gandhi Dancer. Um, it's essentially the foundation of everything we do. Um, it's quite simply just honey, water, and yeast. Uh, bound semi-sweet, and it really expresses the honey that we use. This is our berry picker. It's uh, a mixed berry mellow mel. Uh, it's strawberry forward, but it also contains blackberries, blueberries, and red raspberries. And then this is a growler of the collar. Uh, we do a bourbon barrel series here. Um, it's a 10% Imperial Gandhi Dancer um, that's been aged in a wild turkey barrel. It's one of my personal favorites. I've definitely really been enjoying playing with bourbon barrels. Uh, that's not something we've seen as much of in the industry of late, but we see a lot in the craft brewing industry. So I've tried to bring that uh, barrel program experience over to the meadery in order to uh, try a lot of different flavors. Originally, they've been used to flavor oak spirits, so you have those burned oak sugars that give a sort of a vanilla or vanillin type impression. You get a lot of other very, very subtle flavors, and you get some character from the spirit as well from the barrel. And all that comes together to just add a different dimension to the mead entirely. Mead is largely even more unheard of than maybe some of your typical um, craft beers. We've been really 
really tickled with the amount of places that uh, um, can get behind the, the mead wagon, if you will. Yeah, come to the meadery and try a sample flight. There's a bunch of good ones. What I want people to experience when they drink here is something that's approachable. Uh, what I want people to do is come in and find something very direct, very approachable, very clean, um, very bright. You know, nothing overly complicated, but something very enjoyable. Uh, especially when it comes to the hot Missouri summers, you know, a nice, light, lightly flavored sweet or beverage is nice on a really hot day. The mead at Leaky Roof is delicious. The Mikado with the green tea and mint, it's really surprising, and if you have a chance to try it, you definitely should. I have the bread in the oven, it's toasting up, and I'm going to get started on our pasta carbonara. So in the pan, I have about a pound of bacon that I've chopped up, and I've rendered out the fat. Now, in the recipe in Ferran Adria's book, he actually adds in a little bit of olive oil. It's very unusual. You typically don't add fat to bacon. It's gonna end up being a very rich and delicious pasta sauce. So to the rendered bacon, I am adding in two and a quarter cups of just heavy cream. So this delicious, <laughs> incredibly rich mixture needs to simmer for about 20 minutes. And what that's going to do is just totally infuse that cream with the smoky goodness of all of that bacon. So I'm gonna let this simmer away. And in the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead and cook off my fresh pasta. You can do linguine, you can do really kind of any pasta that you would like, but I do prefer the texture of fresh pasta. So if you can find it in the store, make it yourself, definitely go for the fresh. So the nice hot pasta is going back into the pot. Now I want to pour in all of this bacon cream on top of the pasta. And here's the thing that makes it really special. We have six egg yolks and about a quarter cup of heavy cream in this bowl. I'm gonna go ahead and pour these egg yolks into the hot pasta, stir everything up, and it just thickens and gets rich. I think Ferran Adria wanted to make sure that his team didn't get hungry at all throughout their shift when he's serving rich foods like this for dinner. This is gorgeous. I don't care what you do to bacon and cream, it's going to be utterly delicious. I'm just gonna grate some Parmigiano Reggiano on top. Simple, quick. This is a perfect weeknight meal for your family. So I'm gonna give this a quick taste. So while I devour this bowl of pasta, let's head over to Columbia, Missouri and see how the folks behind Strange Donuts and Soul Taco, two very popular spots in St. Louis, have created a collaboration space right in the middle of downtown. Strange Donuts, Soul Taco, teaming up, making a new restaurant, making a new concept. Uh, we're at Strange Soul in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, off Broadway and hit, and it's in the heart of the downtown district here. So. Almost all arrows pointed here. My fam all my family went to Mizzou. I really uh, saw a great opportunity to be out in this market, and um, there's nothing like like what we're doing over there, or over here, there, here, Columbia, Missouri. We just thought it was a no-brainer to come here and give something fast, casual, with different flavors. You know, you see in college towns a lot of pizzas, burgers, wings, and um, I mean, I love all those things too, but you know, different change of pace is a great thing, I think, from any community. Donut is our favorite food, taco, second favorite food. <laughs> you know, we've been collaborating with our business for the better part of the year, you know, since we opened everything from merchandise to food, and then we were like, well, why don't we collaborate on the ultimate level? And uh, we decided to open a business with our friends. We got the the always popular Fat Elvis. You know, banana pudding, peanut butter cream, chocolate icing, some sprinkles. Korean taco, so we put Korean barbecue marinated meats inside a corn tortilla. Gooey butter, bringing a taste to St. Louis, around the world, starting in Colombia. We have our sesame vinaigrette salad mix as well, carrots, green onions, and then it's topped with a fried egg, which is my favorite thing. Uh, maple bacon, people are, of course, 
fixated on maple bacon. I don't know, we can't even get them off it. So uh, Some days that's all we make is just, we just make. Just put it outside for them. That's all we do, yeah. And birds, I mean, the birds come they out and they it, attack dude. it. They, they carry... love maple bacon birds. Yeah. The older stigma was, you know, just focus on what you're doing and, you know, go about that. There's nothing wrong with that, but I, I, especially um, in St. Louis, I, I feel like we have a tight-knit community within the industry and um, we find out more times than not, you know, if you're working and collaborating together, it's, it's really going to benefit in, on all ends, you know, you know even um, events and whatnot that we collaborate and do these things with, we always hear an awesome, awesome response with it. But us and David, um, it's been it's, a treat. It's awesome. To really like be, to, to be allowed in the back of somebody else's house and see what's really going on yeah. is beneficial for everyone. Our game is so much sharper now, I think Dave would say the same thing, just seeing how he does stuff better than us and where we're lacking. Man, every day is, every day is different, you know, and um, especially being in here with Strange, with Jason and Corey, uh, it's, been, it's been an awesome, it's a whole different idea of just being, instead of being by ourselves, um, we're really working with each other and working off of each, feeding off of each other, and it's been an awesome thing to see. I wanted to do it like a wrestling thing. Let's do it. You see us out here every Friday, Thursday, Saturday. Stop it. <laughs> Open until 2 a.m. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Come on down. Come Open at 7 a.m. every single day. Come on down. If you think you can. We're real aggressive with the way we get our customers in here. When I left that shoot, I had two boxes of donuts and a burrito. It was fabulous. So we are moving on to the second course in Ferran Adria's family meal. And again, a very simple dish that is going to be really delicious. We're going to fry up some cod and some green peppers, and we're gonna put that on some toasted bread with mayo. So the first step is just to salt the cod, and then we're going to dip it into a little bit of flour, and then just a little bit of egg, and that's it. The trick when you're battering something like fish or chicken or anything like that is to have a wet hand and a dry hand, and that way you don't end up with just, you know, the batter caking your fingers. And if you don't want to use cod, feel free to use tilapia or some other kind of flaky white fish that will have a really nice, juicy texture. All the cod is nicely battered, so I'm going to head over to the stove and fry it up. I have two pans ready to go. This one has about an inch and a half of grapeseed oil. You could also use peanut oil or something else that it has a neutral flavor because you do not want to overwhelm the flavor of the fish. The other thing we're cooking to go along with our cod are these wonderful, sweet, long Italian style peppers. They're just gonna very simply be pan fried in this non-stick skillet with just a tiny, tiny bit of oil. My last batch of fried fish goodness is coming out of the oil. And just a little tip when you're cooking these peppers, I have actually added a little bit of water to the pan and covered them so that they kind of cook down a little bit. So assembly of the sandwich is pretty self-explanatory and we're just gonna use some mayo and put a nice slick of it down on some toasted country bread. Now these peppers are pretty big, so just use your judgment if you want to just cut them in half so that you can kind of layer on top and then just put a couple of nice big pieces of this gorgeous fried cod right on top of that pepper. Top it with a little dollop of mayo. 
There you go. This, if you have a chance to read The Family Meal, the, uh, the book by Ferran Adria, he says that this is a very traditional um, snack from his area of Spain. And you get it in bars, uh, wherever you want to go, a tapas bar, and kind of grab a beer or a glass of wine and one of these really wonderful fried snacks. And speaking of wine, um, let's head over to a vineyard north of Kansas City called Vox Vineyards. They are making wines using only North American grapes. It's very unusual and experimental and so let's go hear from the man behind it now. Back in uh, starting back in 1996 it's taken a little bit of while to pull together these grapes which are for the most part not things that you can go out and find in the nurseries. If you do an experiment sometimes you have to be prepared for an answer being no. So this particular aspect of the experiment started with uh, finding a book that was written by a guy named Thomas Volney Munson. He put together the exhibit for the Chicago World Exposition for the USDA, and, and out of that display came this book that he produced, which is all about the, the foundation of American viticulture. And in that book, he identified some 31 genuses of grapes that grow on the planet, of which 27 of them grow in the Midwest. So what are we going to try first? Uh, well, I guess the tradition is we do some whites and then we do some reds. Okay. Um, one of my favorites is the Hidalgo, which, uh, well, you tell me what you think. So where do these grape names come from? Because they're so fun. Uh, Munson, he, he bred so many grapes that he ran out of names. So there, for a while he was naming them after himself and members of his family, and so there was the uh, Mrs. Munson, there's Munson, there's R.V. Munson, there's T.V. Munson, there's Neva Munson, there's Fern Munson, and then the maiden names, his middle name was Valney, so there's a grape called Valney. It has a, it's a really interesting aroma. It's, it sort of uh, reminds me of smoked salmon, and there's some, like an oily. Yes, I, I, I don't yeah. Want to, I don't want to say diesel-y, but, no, no, it but, but there, it's like a, a vegetable oil. Yes, exactly. It's just rich. It's very unique. These grapes, you know, came out of this place. They're they're not they don't have to adapt to survive here. They are they they're born here. Uh, so I need I want to know what they say. And I think with uh, you know some knowledge and, and uh, good winemaking techniques that can be brought forth in a way that couldn't have been 20 or 30 years ago. So how much did you produce of this? Uh, what is it, 15 gallons something oh, like that's that. Oh, that's it. Yeah, the customers have to be explorers. They have to come here. The only way you're going to get your yeah. wines is to come here to the yeah. winery. Unless we can do that kind of conversation over the internet or something. It's so fun to taste wines that are so unfamiliar. Because when you go into another tasting in Missouri, and you already have in your head what a Chardonnay should taste like. You already have in your head what you know a Chamberson should taste like. So this is taking you completely outside of that experience. There's no reference point. Yeah, when people taste wine, they say, oh, this is redolent of raspberries or plums or whatever. No one ever says, this really tastes like grapes. Mm -hmm. um, or this really tastes like Lenore grapes, whatever the heck that is. <laughs> but it's, it's good. It is I mean, good. And the, so besides the grapes and the variability there, there's the variability of the winemaking and what comes out of those grapes. And that's the journey that we're just starting to embark upon. We've seen in general the progress that Missouri wine has made. So I want to kind of apply that here. But I would hope that if by establishing um, the identity and articulating what some of these grapes can be, that others would pick up on it and there would be something more of an indigenous thing that people could be proud of. Those wines were delicious. And you can visit the winery if you make an appointment, but I'm excited to see those wines pop up on uh, wine store shelves pretty soon. And for the third and final course of our Ferran Adria family meal, I'm going to be making an almond soup. Now in America, we don't eat fruit soups or nut soups very often. Essentially, we're kind of making an almond milk. These are chopped, uh, blanched Marcona almonds that have been soaked in water for about 12 hours. And so all I'm going to do is put these into the food processor and process them until they're nice and creamy. Uh, 
I don't have technically a fine mesh sieve, so all I took was my regular strainer and put some cheesecloth on top of it. So if you don't have a fine mesh sieve, it's totally okay. I'm just gonna pour this in. So I am just pushing this through, trying to get every little bit of liquid extracted from the mixture. Just gonna stir in a little bit of sugar until it's dissolved. Then I'm gonna ladle it over some caramel gelato. Sugar is dissolved. I have some caramelized walnuts. You can do caramelized almonds or pistachios or any kind of nut that you like. And then I have this awesome caramel gelato that I'm gonna put right in the middle of our soup. This soup is so unique. If you were to serve this at a dinner party, it would really surprise your guests. I mean, how many people eat almond soup for dessert? I guess just for on Audria. And I think it is about time that we go meet the genius behind El Bouli, one of the world's most innovative and exciting restaurants. It did close a few years ago, but now Ferran Adria is working on establishing a foundation and is consistently trying to push the envelope with creativity and also food. And he has an exhibition of his work that is on view at the Nelson Atkins Art Museum in Kansas City through August. I hope you have a chance to go see it and let's give you a preview now. What I love about this exhibition is not only can we think about food, but we also can think about new ways about thinking about almost any topic and really how he um, deconstructs things, whether it's gastronomy or uh, dining or a restaurant experience or even how we think about products, food products, how we think about cooking. And he deconstructs them and then puts them back together in new ways. And I think you can apply that to so many different disciplines. When people come to, to see this creative space, what do you want them to take away from it? When they walk away, what do you want them to be thinking or feeling? Bueno, para hablar de esta exposición hay que poner un contexto. Por ejemplo, la poca información que hay sobre los procesos creativos de cualquier disciplina hasta hace 100, 150 años. Esto es muy importante porque si no, uno cree que hay mucha información sobre cómo se ha creado durante la historia. Entonces, en general se conoce mucho el resultado final, es decir, el resultado creativo. Pero ¿cómo se ha hecho? Aparte de poner unos dibujos, bueno, y un, unas herramientas, bueno, se hacía así. No, no, me quiero poner en la cabeza del que lo hacía, ¿no? Y esta exposición eh, para el mundo de la gastronomía es muy importante, porque es la primera vez que lo hace. Esta exposición también tiene la importancia de que abre un camino y abre la mente a otras disciplinas de cómo enfocar el proceso creativo a nivel expositivo. ¿no? Es decir, cómo un arquitecto, un diseñador, un pintor muestra, muestra su proceso creativo. Esta exposición como es una posición vista desde el mundo del arte, es una exposición donde tú tienes que descubrir, donde no se te ayuda mucho ¿no? y donde es muy emocional. Es decir, nosotros lo que hacemos a partir de esta experiencia es llevarlo a una parte más, si quieres, divulgativa, experiencial, de investigación. Part of what you said is that collecting um, the creative process, it helps to continue to feed the creative process, that you, um, that throughout your career, you, you've kept all of this information. Did you expect at some point for it to be exhibited or did you only use it for your own point of reference? 
Hasta el año 2011 no hubo ninguna exhibición sobre, sobre restaurantes, era impensable. Todo esto, esto era, nadie lo tenía en la cabeza que esto podía pasar. Y lo increíble es que tenemos 40.000 objetos, documentos, tal, sobre el bulle. Entonces eh, lo estamos ordenando, reordenando, para que la gente pueda comprender el bulle. You're sparking your creativity in all of these different areas. And it's got to be so exciting to be able to collaborate with people in all different disciplines and see how they can, can connect and, and, and create something totally new. In life, one of the ways we have to separate the human beings is what they want to learn or they know everything. In our case, we always want to learn, and that's what we do. When we talk, in this interview, we want to learn. Entonces no, no vamos de que lo sabemos todo. Y esto seguimos haciéndolo. ¿Eh? Por ejemplo, en esta entrevista ha habido una idea muy buena de reflexión que ha sido, es verdad que a veces la primera idea es lo que no tienes que hacer. Y, y, y esto es muy, muy importante. Si ya estás, te marca todo. ¿Eh? Por ejemplo, es que no lo estamos haciendo tal. Así, yo no recuerdo haber hecho, hecho en las miles de entrevistas que he hecho nunca. Fíjate que he hecho y, y me, me, me entalla mucho y seguramente lo, lo vamos, nos vamos a apoderar para hacer algo parecido en el Bully Lab. Entonces, para mí, a nivel de aprender, solo esta cuestión lleva la pena esta entrevista. Te da una visión muy diferente del proceso creativo. Así que a veces eh, tienes que tener la capacidad de lo que no tienes que hacer <risa> antes de lo que tienes que hacer. Absolutamente. También en el proceso creativo está importante darte cuenta o, o, o sobre, sobre, de lo que es importante y no es importante para, para ti. He invented the idea of a foamed sauce and now uh -huh. chefs across the entire exactly. world are doing it and it's something that is almost expected. Exactly. And there's so many things and in fact here in Kansas City I had a salad the other day. It was a smoked salad and it came in a mason jar. And as I walked into the exhibition this morning, I realized there's the mason jar. And I opened the mason jar and wood smoke came out, billowing out into my face. And I thought, there is Farana Adria's influence. Interviewing Ferran Adria was an incredible experience. His intensity in the way that he speaks and looks directly into your eyes while he's expressing himself, it was something I'll never forget and I feel very lucky that I was able to, uh, to meet him. And I hope that you have a chance to get over and see that exhibition, it's very inspiring. So we're wrapping this up. I'm going to pair our Spanish um, family meal with a uh, white blend from Cave Vineyard. Now these folks are located in the St. Genevieve region, which is south of St. Louis along the Mississippi River. It's a really beautiful part of Missouri. This wine has a gorgeous, fresh, fruit-forward nose, and it's gonna go beautifully and cut through the richness of all of this really terrific Spanish fare. So thanks for joining me, and I'll see you next time.